problem and a puzzle are different things. And a study is a kind of problem. Anybody know there's an entire new branch, not new, there's an entire separate branch of chess, which is not about playing, but it's about composing. That means you create chess positions from scratch to try to illustrate some really beautiful chess themes. Some of these are called end game studies, and those are a lot of the tournament players' favorites because they really help you with a part of the game that some people think is kind of dry, the end game. In fact, really one of the most beautiful parts of the game. Now, some of these end game studies and problems are really wacky and have little relation to positions that you'll get in your own game. Yet, even those are, are valuable. Today I'm going to go over um, a couple that I think are really practical that you know, could easily come up in a real game. And then I'll go over a couple that are kind of the opposite. So we'll kind of look at things from both sides. So let's start with this one. Um, and I'm going to give you some time in all of them because they're usually not that easy. But would you have a question? This one's white to move. Is there a win for white, or are we supposed to figure that out? Yeah, you're supposed to figure out. So white to move. What do you think? What do you think the result is? not too easy. It's actually by um, an Israeli composer and um, I, he composed one of my favorite problems. Actually this is not, one, not it. Uh, this is cool but I think this is more of like the practical side. Like this is something that you could kind of come up with in a real game. Because it, it, just in general these types of positions with I think one of the most underrated positions and games to study in chess is end games with rooks against pawns. Because they kind of come up a lot that you have a rook and your opponent has a couple pawns and you have to see whether that rook can stop them or not. Um, Dovoretsky has a great end game book and there is a big, big chunk in that. But I think in general, people ignore them a little bit um, compared to their importance. Like there's a lot of stuff about pawn end games and there's a lot of stuff about rook and pawn end games, but rook versus pawn end games not quite as much as there should be, in my view. So king f5, OK. That's a good idea, but what if I take the pawn with the king instead now? Because you just play king f5. So my king's on h6, and you just played king f5. So now I can play king takes g7. True. So that's the problem. So basically, you're trying to like waste a move. Yes. And unfortunately, king f5 is not a pure waste of a move. So just to, let, let me give a couple of moves here. So g7 check so that we all are on the same page. Because I know everybody in this class is kind of at a different level. But one of the nice things about end games is it's a bit of an equalizer. Like if you're just starting out and you work hard and you try to clear your brain, you can be just as good as a way more experienced player in end games. Same is not true with openings and middle games because it's a lot more about um, experience as well as uh, trying hard in those phases. End game is a bit unique in that way. So g6 check, king h6. Now, the suggestion of king f5 unfortunately fails to king g7. And we also had your suggestion, which was just king to f7. Unfortunately, that fails too, right? Because now we get to take this with check which leaves you no time to make a queen, which I'm sure is what you wanted to do, right? So instead, white to move. Yes. So yes, if we queen the pawn here, black must do what? Take. So notice how almost all these moves are forced by white. That's the kind of nice thing about um, end game studies. It makes you look at all of the moves, even if they seem bizarre. Right, like you wouldn't want to look at a8 equals queen, giving up your queen and your prize pawn, but you just looked at every other move and they all lost, so you might as well look at that, right? It's called process of elimination. And um, it really does make sense if you think of it that way, right? You looked at, there's one move, two moves, 
they both lose. So you look at the third move, right? And that's why it's, it's, you can solve these, these studies and these problems easier than you think, because they seem really difficult. Um, but after rook takes queen, now what on earth can white do? Because it looks like they're just going to lose, right? So they better step to it if they want to have any chance to save this game. It looks like black's just going to come in and win the pawns in the game, right? If you were black in this position, it was your move, what would you do? Yes? I would um, probably, no, right now rook g, rook g8. Exactly, beautiful. You play rook g8, and then you just take both pawns, the end. You know how to mate with a rook versus a king, right? Do you? Rook versus king? Are you sure? Could you beat Magnus Carlsen? With a rook versus a king? How many people here could beat Magnus Carlsen with rook versus king? All right, yes, you can. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, the point is that when you have a rook or a queen versus a king, you should know that end game so well that you can beat anyone with it. It is kind of important. Um, anyway, so rook g8 is a threat, so white must play what? Again, process of elimination, a very difficult problem that anyone can solve if you use this process of elimination thinking. Um, rook g8 is a threat. We don't have very many moves. So what would you play? Yeah? Well, let's try king f7. Seems like the really only possibility. The other, only other real move that like, does anything is making a queen. So let's try king f7. At least now we have a threat, right, of g8 equals queen, right? So now we have a threat to um, immediately draw the game with that move. So what would black have to play here? Rook a7 check. Rook a7 check. Now, what do you think the big idea is here for white? Let's see somebody else. Um, Dylan? I'm sorry, in the name, what's your name in the back? Elliot. Elliot, okay, sorry. Hmm? Um, that's Black's idea, right, so what would White do? What's White's big idea here to try to like save this game, perhaps? Stalemate? Yes, we do have a stalemate idea at the end, very good. Um, but what would you play as White here? King G8. So King G8? And now, if rook takes g7, now what? Yeah, exactly. So king to h8 now. And notice that if the rook or the king takes on g6, it's what? It's just an instant draw, right? Stalemate, no moves, right? You guys see that? This is a very, very common in game trick. It comes up a lot. So I would categorize this as one of those endgame studies that's um, really practical. Because you solve it, but you also learn something. Now, one important point, what if black plays rook to a7 instead? Now what should white do? Again, process elimination is just like one forcey move. Um, what would you do here? Yes. Who said it? So raise your hand. Somebody else, raise your hand. How, what, what happens here? What's the forcing way to finish this game? How about somebody who I, I haven't called on yet? Somebody new? Just want to make sure everybody's following. So I'm um, repeating this theme. Uh, how about in that row back there? Does anybody see it here? Second row. What white must play here to score the immediate draw? Move the pawn up one. Exactly. G7. And now um, we're threatening G8, so they have to take. And again, it's a stalemate. All right. So this is a type of a problem that I love to study with uh, my students and myself, because not only does it help with your um, it helps with your imagination as well as your calculation. And both of those things are pretty important in chess. Now, yeah. Do I need to flip the board every time? I don't know what happened. Yeah. All right, now this one is a little different in that I would, I would categorize this one as not quite as practical, but it's really fun. 
So what would you do here is white. You're going to love this one. This one's not easy at all. So what you want to do again is look at all of your possible moves. Again, these types of positions can be a big equalizer because even if you haven't studied chess really seriously, it's all about looking at all of your possible moves and then trying to analyze the tree of each one. Um, let's, let's take a little longer. This, this one's really a uh, little, uh, very difficult. So you might want to just like make sure you're looking at all the different possibilities before you pick one. No, clear, I mean, in this one we're trying to win is white. Because if we were trying to draw, we have a m m bunch of different ways to draw, right? Like rook takes knight is, is one idea, but rook takes a8, Knight takes a8 and king takes a7, right? There's no way, um, there's no way black's going to win that, right? But they can play, um, they can play king takes c6 so that after king takes a8, you can't, you can't escape that. Um, this is like, for, again, this is actually very practical. This is a really important thing. Knight takes a8, king takes a7. Um, now, if uh, king takes c6, king takes a8. Um, well, there's just king b5. But even if we didn't have king b5, like suppose our um, suppose the pawn was like one further on a6, um, this is still a draw because the white king can't escape. That's really important, right? So just to illustrate, like say um, it's like this, right? Notice that when we put this king here, there's nothing they can do because if they put their pawn on a7, it's again a stalemate, right? And if they go here. What would you do as black? King C8. You must play king c8, right? If you play king c this you're, you're leaving them in this cage, right? This is a little cage with just two steps. If you make this move, it's a massive blunder, because now what can white do? And, and this is, seems very simple, but I'll tell you it comes up in every game. You know, especially if you're in a blitz time scramble at the end, it's so easy to make mistakes with this exact position. Um, yes? Exactly, king to b8, and now um, it's actually um, white who wins the game. So um, Winston, right? No, Wilson. Wilson, and you're Winston. Okay, got it. But you knew that too, right, Winston? You knew. So what else can we do here? So work takes a8 only leads to a draw, but that variation is very instructive. So that's what I mean. Like you get to look at these really cool variations, but you also it's like you're eating your uh, you have like your your real basic nu nutritional stuff here, and that like that last variation that's very nutritious. You need that to get better and to be a proficient end game player, and then you have your dessert as well, which are some like really beautiful variations that we're about to see. But you need to find white's continuation. This is absolutely amazing. So, you, like, so you, we can look at it. So you're thinking if uh, pawn takes knight here, now um, you're basically thinking that they're going to have to take here. And you're thinking that you're going to be able to come in with your pawns and, and beat me, right? There is a little bit of a problem with that. What did you want to play here? So you want to take the A pawn with what? The king or the pawn? OK, now if you take with the pawn, um, I have a good move here. Well, I guess it's kind of forced. B1 might work also, actually. Maybe I'm wrong that it's forced. Uh, yeah, I think rook B1 works too. And then the idea is just if you queen, um, we check. After here, rook takes a8. Now king takes a8, king takes c6. Nobody wins, right? That's a problem. So you're very, very close. Like if you had one more move, you would win that, right? And unfortunately for you, king takes a7 also doesn't work because now what can black play? Rook takes b6 wouldn't work because then king takes b6 and the pawn's going to make a queen. But what can black play instead here, which salvages the draw? Um, what do you think? Exactly. Well, we, t we t actually take on c6, right? C6. Yes. And now, if they take this, we do what? Take the 
And then it's just, again, king versus king. Nobody wins that, right? So a very close try, Winston, but a lot of times, Winston and Wilson. But the problem is, in these endgame studies, a lot of times, these obvious looking moves, like pawn takes b6, they don't cut the mustard. Usually, it's something more spectacular that uh, saves the day. So what's the spectacular way for white to win, and why? Um, Elliot? OK, what's your starting mode? Um, rook d8, it's good to look at every single possible move, but that one doesn't, that rook to d8, rook takes d8, and it's uh, tough to come up with a continuation there. Rook b7? Not rook b7, although that is interesting. Yeah, I mean, I guess the problem is we can just take on c6 in these variations, you know? Yeah? OK, yeah, you process of elimination. We tried everything, so we better try C7, especially because it's a forcing move, right? It's always good to look at the forcing moves here, because if C7, it's pretty clear now that we've got some massive threats, right? Rook takes A8, knight takes A8, queen. So you don't really have a lot of choice here for black. If you're black here, you have to play what? Rook. Well, rook takes rook just allows pawn takes B8 equals queen, right? So basically, the only move here for black is what? King takes pawn. King takes pawn, yes. And then I challenge you to figure out what white can do then. So now, now let's take a look. I think now we're close enough that maybe some of us can get it. Um, let's think a little bit longer. So if king takes c7. King, pawn, c7, and you have rooks again. OK, yeah, the, the idea is after king takes c7, what is um, that? Exactly. So you're saying. After king takes c7, rook takes a8, knight takes a8, king takes a7, there's no win. Yes. OK, but, there is, but that's why you have to find something better for white. So king takes c7, white to move and win. I'll give you this move. OK, fine. So you, you get to see it from this position. White to move and win now. Somebody sees it. I don't see anyone's hand. Nobody's oh. hand is up. <laughs> but there is, a, there is a very beautiful one here. which I promise you will never come up in a game. But everything else we looked at will. <laughs> this will probably not. OK. Yeah, I'll, I'll be very excited if it comes up in one of your games. You'll have to email me. It's, it's extremely unusual. Though. I've never seen it before. Very, very rare idea here for white. Pawn takes knight check. So pawn takes knight check. And then, and then what, would, uh, what would black do? Yes, you can take the rook with the king. Pawn takes pawn's not going to go too well. Because if pawn takes pawn, then you just play rook takes a8, right? If he takes the rook with the king, then you push to b7. And he can't take, he's got to move the king to uh, c7, and he takes the rook. Exactly. Yeah. So it's a very, very unusual idea. Excellent. So you start with pawn takes b6 check. And note that this pawn can't capture on b6 because then rook takes a8, right? So that would just be a rook versus a pawn. So instead, you must look at, after pawn takes b6, you must look at this move, king takes rook, right? But now white can play the move. What move can white play here? Winston, what can we play here? White, were you listening? B7. OK, very good. B7. What's that? Trapping the rook. Yes, we're trapping the rook, but even worse, if black could just say pass here, that would be pretty good, right? Pass. I don't want to make a move. Is that OK? No. King takes the rook. Exactly. Black would get number sign. That's right. Exactly. So w what is this called? If we could pass, our position would be fine. But we must make a move. What is that called? Elliot? Zugzwang, very good, Zugzwang. Zugzwang is one of the coolest concepts in chess. It's a really important concept in the end game. It almost never comes up in the middle game. There is a famous uh, position or two where there's Zugzwang in the middle game, but it's usually reserved for the end game. In the opening in the middle game, 98% of the time, it's good for us to have a move, right? 
we want to have moves. We have lots of stuff that we can do that helps our position. The end game is the exception where sometimes having a move hurts us. And this is a case right here uh, because we really would just like to stick this king here so that after pawn takes, king takes, right? But instead, we must move our king up to c7. And now, of course, we make a queen and um, we win the game shortly thereafter. So, any questions about that position? But uh, I, I, love, I love how it kind of combines the practical and the spectacular, which is, you can't really get much more from that in a study. OK, let's start with this one. So this one is white to move. Rook D1, why? Oh, I, I thought you said D. I think somebody said D. Somebody in the front row said D. Yeah, Rook to D1, and why Rook D1? Because uh, Buenos no checks, exactly. It gives White no good checks, right? We can't really check on D8. We can't check on D5. And now, meanwhile, Black is threatening to play what? just to queen the pawn with h1. So then what would white do? Hey, stop messing with the clock, please. Um, mm -hmm. maybe it needs to, just waiting you, but it needs to No, let's try to let's try to figure that out. So everybody, I'm going to put I'm going to put the position out on the board actually. All right, so now white to move. Anybody see what to do here for white? Because black's just threatening to make a queen, and then after queen takes queen, rook takes queen, check, they'll take our pawn off, and that won't be good. Same thing, queen h1. Exactly, so you're trying to play queen h1, sacrificing your queen, and now if rook takes queen, what can white do? Yes? Push the pawn, and now... If we play here, what's the difference? It's check. Exactly, we get a check here. That's right. And then after they play something like that, they have to move their king over. What can we do now? Queen. What's the best move, yeah? Queen uh, b8. Exactly, queen to b8. Hitting the king and hitting the pawn. And then uh, white will end up winning that. How many people here uh, can win with a queen versus a rook? That one is a little harder than rook versus king, especially if you're playing against a computer. Luckily, against humans, it's pretty easy because everybody hangs their rook eventually. But <laughs> it's true. I mean, it sounds really bad, but it's true. It's like it's just very difficult. The computers are just really notorious at that end game, but it's almost impossible to defend for like a normal person. Um, so what we're going to do with this one is I'm going to have you guys play it out so that we can get our hands dirty. One thing that'll teach you is if you do have a really tough problem, go back to the old-fashioned chessboard and chess set. Don't study everything on your computer. Even Magnus Carlsen studies with a chessboard and a chess set. Um, some of the top players in the world only study on the computer, but I really think it's more fun to occasionally set positions up like this in a chessboard because that's how you're going to be playing your most important games. So I'm not saying do it 100% of the time, because if you did it 100% of the time, you wouldn't be getting in enough volume. Like if you want to study like 100 tactics in a week, you don't want to have to set up 100 different positions, right? You want to do some of them on the computer. But for the tough ones, get out your board in pieces, OK? How many people already do that? OK, good. So you're ahead of the game. But I was really shocked at how much quicker you guys got this just by sending it up. It's really amazing. Um, many of you solved the position uh, quickly, whereas if I gave you two minutes to solve it up here, I, I don't think that would have happened. Maybe, but probably not. So um, g7, and now rook to c2 check, which is a key move here so that the king blocks that path of the pawn, right? So after king b8, rook g2 stopping the other pawn, now b7. Rook takes pawn, and now we recognize this position from one of the problems we looked at earlier in the class, right? Very similar situation 
where white has to play what? OK, how many people got to this position? OK, good. I, I know you two back there did. Uh, all three of you back there did. Yeah, you all got to this position. Um, and then somehow, some people got to a position where, OK, so work takes B7 is going to be an immediate draw, right? So black's going to try to win, right? So he's going to play rook g8 instead. Now, this is where a lot of you got thrown off big time. A lot of you thought that the solution now for white was to make a knight here, right? Um, how many people tried that? I saw at least two or three people trying that. But what, didn't you guys try that? I thought you did. You did? Yeah. Um, but th th that's a good idea. It's very good to be creative and think about that. But the problem is it's just not the right one here. Um, because, yeah, I mean, if we, if we play here, then there's no moves for white, right? But um, if we play, uh, which would be good because white wants to draw, but if they just play here, then you're in a, uh, a sticky situation, right? Because now white has to play this. And now what can black do? Well, yeah, you have to calculate this out, but it looks like black's, white's going to be one move too slow here, correct? Look at that. Why does black have to come down? Why can't it just come across? What's that? You don't have to really calculate. Just hold white across yeah. at the top of white. Working. Well, the other thing is here, you don't even need to take this knight. So you can also just check here. I mean, you're going to be winning this with the extra pawn. I mean, I wouldn't even, honestly, I wouldn't even calculate rook takes knight just in case I'm wrong. I think it's kind of silly when you can just play rook g2 and win the pawn and then just cause immediate resignation. It's just not very practical, right? I, in fact, I think that's a really an important lesson. Like, it requires a lot, of, a lot more work to do that. Whereas you can just play rook g2 and rook takes h2 and win absolutely in your sleep, right? Like everybody will win that position. Now that doesn't mean that you shouldn't calculate rook takes b8 for practice, but in a practical game, if it's that easy to just win another piece, um, you really want to be doing that, right? Does that make sense? But um, white can make it a lot harder by instead of making a knight, making what? No. Just by making a queen and forcing them to take us, right? I mean, just simple chess. Because if you think about it, knight, the only thing it does that the other move doesn't do is check. But it still gives you the option of playing rook takes b8, except it also gives black the option of playing king b5, right? Whereas queen doesn't do any of that, right? It just forces rook takes b8. Does that make sense, guys? And now after king b8, king b6, this is a really important position. What should black, what should white do? What do you think? King A8. Okay, why not King C8? What happens if King C8? Uh, Somebody try to play this out for me as black. Somebody play black, black for me here. Uh, Elliot, you want to try playing this for me for black? Somebody else? Yeah? Okay, King C6. Now suppose I play here. Okay, um, suppose I play here. Okay, well, at some point you should probably, okay. Now, can you get five to choose this draw? Okay. And I choose, um, after four. Can you get three? Can you get two? No, I'm too slow. Can you choose the draw? Yeah, good. Very good. So optical illusion there. It looks like you're going to be fast enough in that. Very, it looks like these are, it's going to be the same, but really it's not, right? So somebody want to show me the right way? Somebody else? Some, I know a lot of you got it. Somebody want to try now for white the right way? Elliot, you want to play out for white? OK, so king a8 instead, right? That's for starters. And now, um, well, to make progress towards going to this pawn, I guess I should go there. Now what? It's very key. There's a very key square that you want to reach ultimately. What is the square that white ultimately wants to reach here? What's the key square? F2, F2 right. So what is the fastest pass to F2? Wilson? Winston? Okay, good. And now 
Suppose we go here. Mm hmm. That's right, you're there just in time. So see that one difference in move gave White that, uh, that tempo needed. So a very instructive position, which started all the way over here where there's that like, little optical illusion because this looks closer to this than that. But in reality, it's this key square over here that we need to get to to go down there. And this doesn't help us, right? So it's a really bizarre um, illusion almost that it's easier to see like just by playing out, right? You can't really um, absorb it visually so well. But um, yeah, great job, guys. I hope you learned something. And the really important, that, that end game there in the end where Black has to get to, to F2 to make the draw or F1 is very, very common. So all this like cool stuff around it, that's like um, the study problem where the composer makes it look beautiful. But that final stuff will come up in end game after end game. Mm -hmm.